Certainly, uh, Bree Newsom is uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful human being who needs no introduction in all of the civilized world, amen. <laughs> She's my homegirl, my comrade, my friend, and uh, I'm just so blessed uh, to be able to uh, welcome her to um, the way today. Uh, we were together several months ago, and uh, we were talking just a little bit about the importance of uh, us continuing, particularly in this moment, to not only be faithful uh, in our resistance against injustice and white supremacy, but also to continue to be uh, faithful in the faith and the tradition that has produced us. Amen. Bree is, uh, comes from a rich legacy of Christ followers. Amen. Uh, she, she can certainly tell it better than I can, but her father uh, was uh, one of the professors and directors of the departments at Duke Divinity School for many years. And uh, soon thereafter, he went to uh, Howard and was uh, there at the Howard University uh, Divinity School. And, and uh, it's so funny, I was um, in Cincinnati for an event that Major League Baseball was doing around um, uh, Black Lives Matter and all these different things. And <clears throat> there was this the gentleman there whose name was uh, Dr. Newsom, and um, I, I, I didn't know that it was her father. He was the director of the Underground, under, underground Railroad Museum in Cincinnati, and so we just talking, and I told him I went to Duke. She said, oh, oh, I used to be at Duke, and I was like, oh, wow, and then we started talking more, and he was like, yeah, I'm so proud of my daughter. You know, he's just talking, like I knew what he was talking about, and then after a while, I was like, oh, snap, you breeze that. He was like, oh, yes, I am. Then he said, rather, she's my daughter. I was like, oh, my bad. <laughs> it comes from a rich legacy of, of people who love Jesus, but also are committed to justice, and so um, not not very many of us who are like unapologetically uh, Christian, unapologetically black, un unapologetically for justice, working in this uh, this moment all across the country. And so I love Bree and thank God for her witness. And I'm just so glad to have her at the way she blazed her talk yesterday at UC Berkeley. So I don't know if there's too much left, but I think she got a little bit more for us. So come on, stand to your feet, everybody, and let us put our hands together for the spokeswoman for the King of Glory. She is Bree Newsom today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. I've just been between really all week, honestly, ever since I knew I was going to be coming to speak to you. I've just been praying for the Holy Spirit to be with me so I could bring a good word for you. Um, thank you so much to the McBride family for, I think I will pull it up. Um, thank you so much to the McBride family for, for hosting me here this weekend. This has been wonderful. Um, I met Brother Michael McBride for the first time uh, during the anniversary of the Ferguson Uprising. And um, I just appreciate so much your commitment to justice and activism uh, in this area. I mean, Jesus calls us to love, and I don't know what love looks like in action except to work on behalf of justice. So thank you um, also to the Way Church family for receiving me so warmly today, and thank you for the work that you continue to do in this community. Uh, thank you also to Sister Latifah Simon for that wonderful word. Thank you. Uh, the title of this sermon is Feeling Like Moses. So I would like to examine with you this morning the life of Moses. Moses is, of course, one of the most significant figures in the scriptures. He's the great prophet who speaks directly to God, hand-delivering God's law to the Hebrews, shepherding the Hebrews during their extended period of wandering into the desert following the exodus from Egypt. I want to examine the life of Moses because the story of Moses is not simply the story of one Hebrew boy who survived to become a great man, but it is the story of every child who survives circumstances designed to destroy them. It is the story of a people living as a nation within a nation, utterly lost to the despair of oppression and slavery, colonized and confused until God delivers them from physical and spiritual bondage. You know, I was reading something um, very interesting recently. Apparently, there is a museum uh, of the Bible. There's a museum that's all about the history of the Bible. They have on display uh, various versions of the Bible. And one version that they have is a, a slave master's Bible. 
And what's interesting and significant about that Bible is uh, one of the books that's missing from it is Exodus. The entire book of Exodus is missing from the slave master's Bible. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think that's surprising when you, when you think about it, if you're at all familiar with the story of Exodus, if you can imagine a, a slave master trying to keep Africans enslaved, why they, first of all, wouldn't want to allow the Africans to read the Bible for themselves, and why even when they would get ready to teach, so-called teach the Bible to the enslaved Africans, they would remove the entire story of Exodus from it. And I think that's because there's no way that you can read the story of the Hebrews and not see the direct parallels to the condition and experience of Africans enslaved in America. But before I deep dive into the story of Moses, I, I have to take it back a few generations for some important historical context. See, the story of the Hebrews doesn't begin with slavery. The Hebrews were not always enslaved in Egypt. In fact, several generations prior to Moses, Egypt is saved from starvation by a Hebrew named Joseph, right? Moses' ancestor Joseph lives like a king in Egypt. Now, he didn't start out as a king in Egypt, obviously, if you're familiar with the story, but by the end of his ordeal, Joseph is a highly respected official in the service of the Pharaoh. And the book of Genesis concludes with Joseph dying at the age of 110 and being buried in Egypt as an Egyptian in the Egyptian way, but not before reminding his brothers of God's promise to their great-grandfather Abraham that God would surely come to their aid and bring them all out of Egypt and into the promised land. Now, fast forward several generations, the Israelites have remained in Egypt. They've grown greatly in number, so much so that the land is filled with them. Then the Bible says that there came to power in Egypt a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing. This king had no regard for history, no regard for the achievements of the Hebrew Egyptian Joseph. Now, in 2018, in the United States, we know something, right, about what it's like to have a know-nothing king who has no regard for our history, who thinks we all come from S-hole countries and deals with us so accordingly. Well, in Egypt, this pharaoh thought the best way to deal with the Israelites was to enslave and oppress them, but even in their enslavement and oppression, they continued to multiply, to spread, to leave an indelible mark upon the Egyptian land. Instead of dying, they were multiplying. So Pharaoh sets about a plan of genocide. He says to the Hebrew midwives, every time a, a Hebrew woman gives birth, if it's a boy, I want you to kill him immediately. But the midwives, of course, they feared God too much to do that. So then Pharaoh, he gives an order to all his people, and he says, you are to take a Hebrew boy, if you see him, and you are to toss him in the Nile and feed him to the crocodiles. Did you know? that black children in this country used to be referred to as gator bait. Did you know that? That's a, that's a historical fact. Now, it wasn't a widespread practice, but it did happen that black babies would be taken from their homes at night and used as bait for alligators. That's how they would hunt alligators, skin them, and use their skin. Um, I mean, you can go look it up for yourself. It was, it was a common racial slur that they would use to refer to children, black children, as gator bait made songs about it, mama's gator bait, had postcards designed with children and gators, calling them gator bait. See, this is why they don't let us read the word for the, ourselves. That's why they didn't want us to read it, right? Because when you start reading the word for yourself, you start reading the living word, things start coming alive for you and opening your eyes. So this is the circumstance into which Moses is born. Descended from greatness, destined for greatness, Yet born into a circumstance, into a society that places no value on his life because of his, because of his ethnicity, because of his heritage and his ancestry. And like any loving mother, like many mothers today, Moses' mother is trying to do what she can to save his life, to spare him from the claws of this oppressive power. She hides him for as long as she can, but when she can no longer hide him or protect him, she has no other option left except to place him in a basket by the Nile and, and hope that something would work out. And fortunately, of course, God intervened and Moses' life ends up being spared. And here Moses finds himself being raised in an Egyptian palace, a Hebrew, destined for slavery, destined for the Nile, destined for slavery at best. And yet here he is 
in the Egyptian palace receiving a first class education, being treated like an Egyptian prince. Yet he knows that he's still a Hebrew. He knows that he wasn't, by all measures and accounts, supposed to be where he is. See, just because you survive a circumstance that was designed to destroy you doesn't mean that you aren't affected by it. When I examine the story of Moses, I'm reminded of the many students I encounter when I travel and I speak at college campuses around the country who find themselves in circumstances they didn't think they could ever find themselves in. Um, several of them are the first generation in their family to attend college. Many of them are undocumented students. There was a really interesting moment yesterday, uh, as uh, Pastor McBride mentioned, um, we, I spoke over at UC Berkeley, and following my speech, we had a panel where we were just kind of discussing all the various circumstances going on today, talking about black liberation broadly, we touched on Wakanda. <laughs> um, but something else that came up there was this idea of tokenism, um, and this practice of, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not really integrated, right, we're, we're legally, Legally, segregation has ended, but in reality, we're still highly segregated. And in reality, only a few really get into some of these institutions. I think one of the students told me yesterday at UC Berkeley, the black student population is at about 3%, is that correct? About 3% of the black population? So when I look at the story of Moses, I can imagine what that was like for him at that time. He was a token token in the Egyptian palace, and all of these things had to weigh heavily on his mind and in his heart. So one day, of course, Moses goes out and he sees this Egyptian guard being abusive towards a Hebrew, and thinking that no one is looking, he murders that guard and buries him in the sand. He goes out the next day and he sees two Hebrews fighting with each other, and he says to them, you know, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? He can't understand this. He can't understand how you can have hate towards your fellow Hebrew. And the response he gets is even more shocking, right? They're basically like, who are you? <laughs> who are you? You want to be ruler and, and, and judge of us? You want to kill us like you killed that Egyptian? And that must have been shocking to Moses. See, he thinks he's coming out here in some Hebrew solidarity, right? He, he's coming out here on his, on his Hebrew consciousness, right? But the Hebrews that he encountered didn't see it that way. Oppression is something, isn't it? It really works a number on people. See, violence breeds violence, and we see that in the story of Moses. All the comforts of the Egyptian palace couldn't shield Moses from the reality of the violence that surrounded him, and he ended up resulting to that same violence himself. And then you have the two fighting Hebrews. They're living in violent conditions on a daily basis, and they become inwardly violent toward each other and towards themselves. They don't understand this concept of Hebrew solidarity that Moses seems to be seeking. There is no united Hebrew identity. There is no Hebrew liberation movement going on. In fact, years later, when they're in the desert and Moses has gone onto the mountain too long, the Hebrews immediately revert to all the practices that they learned from Egypt. They build a golden calf resembling the Egyptian god Apis and begin to worship it. I think that says something about the extent to which the Israelites had lost much of their cultural and religious identity during their hundreds of years of oppression in Egypt. They had been effectively colonized. So it's not surprising then that when Moses asked the fighting Egyptians, why are you fighting each other? It doesn't even register to them that there should be some sense of cultural unity based on their experience as Hebrews. I know a whole lot of black leaders, activists, and organizers that can relate to that experience. You get out here and you start talking about black unity, some people are going to look at you sideways like you're crazy. Oppression. Well, Moses, he's so overwhelmed by it all and, and fearful that Pharaoh will be after him once it's discovered what he's done, that he's killed this Egyptian. That, so he flees into the desert, begins a whole new life. Whole new life. None of the education, none of the privileges, none of the trappings that come with the Egyptian palace had any relevance to this new life that he's living now out in the desert, out in the wilderness. A shepherd. You know, shepherds are dirty. Shepherds live in dirt all the time. And I'm sure that's something that he never aspired to be, something that he never thought he would be. And I can imagine that a lot of things about Moses' life were confusing for him right up until the moment that he saw the burning bush. 
And even then, a lot of things didn't make sense to Moses. God is talking about how he's calling him to go speak to the Egyptian pharaoh. And Moses, I can't, I have a stutter. What are you talking about? That can't be me. I know nothing about leading people. How can I possibly do any of this? I don't, it, it might have been years and years later when they were out in the desert actually wandering around and Moses is up on the mountain that it finally clicked for him how all of that made sense. How it made sense that he had to be spared. How he had to be brought up in the Egyptian palace so he could have some understanding of the Egyptians. So he could go talk to the Egyptians in a way that they would understand what he was saying. He had to live in that world between the Egyptians and the Hebrews so that he could do what he had to do. He had to spend years in the desert if he was going to lead people through the desert he had to go through that so you have to trust God's process in your life now people often ask me did I know growing up that I would become an activist or that I would do something as dramatic as climbing the flagpole and removing the, the confederate flag in South Carolina and the answer is absolutely not absolutely not if you had met me 10 years ago, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking along those lines. Uh, as Pastor McBride mentioned, you know, I grew up in a family of uh, people who were very justice-minded. My parents were both educators. My mother, in particular, did a lot of work around trying to close the achievement gap. So I grew up seeing my mother doing you know, a lot of work around how to help children who were poor, children who came from families where the first language wasn't English, uh, children who had all these different things stacked against them in, a, in an educational system that was not built to educate them so much as to incarcerate them. And so I grew up witnessing that, but, but I, wasn't, I wasn't planning to be an activist. My, my heroes were the great activists of old, but I wasn't planning to be an activist. I was planning to get my education, get my degree, get a good job, right? Be a source of pride to my race, right? Be an exceptional black person, right? And then I would figure out how I reach back, how I give to my community, how I do all of those things. And so that's what I was, that's what I was set about doing. I was a Hebrew in an Egyptian palace. I got into New York University. I was a film major. I didn't even appreciate at that time, to be honest with you, the, the level of the lack of diversity in the film industry. Praise God, because that might have been a deterrent for me. So I'm just in there. I'm, I'm in NYU. By the time I got to my senior year class, I was one of uh, two women and the only person of color in my writing and directing class. So I, I was a Hebrew in an Egyptian palace, just trying to, just trying to figure it all out. I had uh, made a short film my senior year. Did very well on the film festival circuit. I uh, competed in the Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival, which was sponsored by an ad agency in New York called Sachi and Sachi, huge ad firm. They, they do the advertising for most of the things that you own in your house probably, own about everything in this world. And so they invited me to come be an artist in residence in New York City. So here I am on my way. I'm still operating in my plan that I had set up for myself, right? about what I'm supposed to be doing, this, this whole lifelong plan that I have laid out for myself. And that's the track that I was on. Went up there, did that for a while. Realized when I was there, you know, the advertising world, that's definitely not for me. Wasn't sure what I wanted to do next. Came back down to North Carolina. And that's when I realized, I just had this sense that I needed to tap into something greater than myself. I was always a very ambitious person. Always had a lot of personal ambition. But I, 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 I knew that there was something greater than personal ambition, and so I got on my knees. This is, this is my testimony I'm giving y'all now. I got on my knees, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, you know what I want for my life. You know everything that I want for my life. I want to set that aside. I want to set that on the altar and offer that up to you, and I want you, ooh, I'm about to get emotional already. <laughs> I want you to tell me what you want for my life. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, just, it, just, it just gets me emotional because it's just my truth. Um, I said, Lord, I want you to, to tell, show me what you want for my life, and that's when it became clear for me. I just needed to turn outside of myself. I needed to turn towards things that were bigger than me, that were greater than me, that did service for others. And of course, at this time, there were a lot of things going on. This is around the time that the Newtown shooting had happened. Um, this is in the wake of the Trayvon Martin case. 
Um, North Carolina had begun a vicious attack on voting rights within our state once the U.S. Supreme Court uh, struck down key parts of the Voting Rights Act. And so, and so that's kind of when I jumped into activism. And I never said to myself even then, I'm going to be an activist, right? I just said, okay, if I'm going to get out here and really be about Jesus, I better really be about justice. And what am I going to do? So I joined up with the uh, North Carolina NAACP, participated in a lot of the Moral Monday protests. I got arrested uh, during a voting rights sit-in. Of course, that about put 50 more gray hairs on my mama's head. <laughs> um, promised I would, would not make a habit of getting arrested and really didn't plan to do it again. I had become, I really didn't. <laughs> Telling you the truth, really didn't. Um, I, I, I really kind of evolved into being a community organizer. I participated in a lot of protests. I went down to Florida when the Dream Defenders were there protesting over Trayvon. I went up to Ohio with the Ohio Students Association when they were demanding the release for, of the tapes uh, in the case of John Crawford, young black man who was killed by police in Walmart. So that's what I was doing. You know, I'm here to, here to participate and, and ended up kind of settling into the role of community organizer in Charlotte, North Carolina. And that's where I was and that's what I was doing in June of 2015 when a white supremacist went into Mother Emanuel AME Church and murdered nine black parishioners during a prayer meeting. And I remember, I will never forget that night. I was, I can't even tell you now why I was up late, but for some reason I was up late that night. I don't know if y'all remember the night that that happened, but it happened late at night when the news broke. The news didn't really get national until late that evening. And so there was this very strange, surreal period of time where those few of us who were up and watching the news knew what had happened, but the majority of the world had not turned on the news yet. And I knew that the next morning was going to be a different world. There was gonna be a change there. And so I sat in those hours between night and, and, and morning and I just prayed to God. I said, how long, Lord? How long does this go on? The people who were killed in Charleston, they only did what Christians are supposed to do, which is to open the doors to anyone who knocks on the doors. And I said, Lord, this has been going on for so long. This violence, I thought about the four little girls in Birmingham. Excuse me. I thought about the four little girls in Birmingham. I thought about Medgar Evers. I thought about Clementa Pinkney, who had just, a few days before being gunned down in his own church, had succeeded in getting body camera legislation passed in response to the case of Walter Scott, another black man gunned down and killed by police. And I said, Lord, I, I just don't understand. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm trying to follow you. I'm trying to trust you. But Lord, help me, I just don't understand. I didn't know what we were gonna do. I went to, uh, we held a vigil there in Charlotte, like many people did around the nation. And uh, at our, our own local AME church, Little Rock AME Church, uh, which my, my great aunt belonged to, took me to, grew up in that church. And uh, that's what struck me because I was like, there's nothing happening in Charleston that's not happening in Charlotte. You know, why, why Clementa Pinckney? Why not some of us? But then I turned to action because that's how I am. <laughs> I can only weep for so long and then I got to get up and I got to figure out what's next. And so that's when we got real about taking the flag down in Columbia, South Carolina. I had spoken about it um, previously with an activist who was also from South Carolina, had roots in South Carolina. Um, half of my family is from North Carolina, but my mom's family is from South Carolina. Um, I had ancestors who were enslaved in Rembert, South Carolina on the eve of the Civil War. I know their names, I've gone to their grave sites. And so I had had a previous conversation, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna make a habit of getting arrested, but if I had a chance to take that flag down, I'll go down back to jail for that. Just because I had grown up with it, I mean, this was something that we, we always, you know, always knew about. You know, there in, in South North Carolina and, 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 and uh, South Carolina, we always knew about that Confederate flag. It was no confusion to me with that, with that flag meant and what it represented. How it was raised in 1961 over the dome of the South Carolina Capitol as a statement of anti-civil rights. Now they tried to say that it was to commemorate the Civil War, but I know the Civil War began in 1860. So how are you gonna tell me you're celebrating the 100 years of the Civil War in 1961? So we knew what that was about. I remember watching television in the year 2000 
when the South Carolina legislature moved the flag from the dome to the lawn of the Capitol. And at the time that they did that, they wrote into the law that the flag couldn't be lowered for any reason unless there was a two-thirds majority approval from the State House. Which is like, I mean, two-thirds is what you put for a, a constitutional amendment. So basically just trying to write into the law that this flag cannot be lowered for any reason. They even built a four foot tall spoked fence around the flag with about a, a 16 square foot radius around it to protect this symbol of hate. So here we are in, in 2015, a black state legislature, civil rights activist, gunned down by a white supremacist in his church, in a historically black church in Charleston, South Carolina, and his casket is being processed through the streets of Columbia, South Carolina. The American flag is at half staff. The state flag of South Carolina is at half staff. And the Confederacy's flag is still flying high. So we had to go take it down. We met, we met. It, uh, it, 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 was, it, was, it was just an intolerable situation. That whole moment visually, it, it, it encapsulated everything that we had been saying up to that point about how the system doesn't value the lives of black people. It was saying it all, so we met, uh, it was a Saturday, Saturday, June 27th, 2015 is when we took the flag down. And it was a Tuesday before that nine of us as activists came together to discuss how to take it down. Now, I mentioned previously this, this activist friend of mine, his name was Yen, who I spoke to about, you know, theoretically, if the opportunity ever came for us to take the flag down. Well, once it actually became a reality, he pulled together these two groups of activists. Half of us were black, the other half were white. Half of us had not met the other half of the activists that night. And I think it says something about Yen's character that we were willing to come together in that moment to talk about something so dangerous and be willing to trust each other when we all didn't know each other. But we knew, I knew if Yin said you were all right, you're all right. And one of the people that I met for the first time that night was James Tyson, who got arrested along with me on that day, uh, a white man. And so we're sitting there and, you know, we're trying to figure out, okay, are, are we going to do that? Yes, we talked through that. Yes, we're not going to wait for the legislature to do that. We've been waiting for South Carolina to do the right thing for 100 years. We can't wait for them anymore. So we're not going to wait for the legislature to do it. We're going to go ahead and do this. Well, how are we going to do it? Like I said, there was this four-foot-tall spoked fence built around the pole. So that's how the method became scaling the pole, because that was the most practical way to do it. So the first question was, okay, who can scale the pole? Uh, that can also risk getting arrested? That was the first question. That narrowed it down to three of us. And of those three, uh, I was the only person of color. And obviously, you know, I have a personal connection to South Carolina. I have um, a background in communication, so I feel comfortable kind of dealing with some of the media onslaught um, that would come after it. And of course, we recognized how powerful an image that would be to see a black woman taking down the Confederate flag in South Carolina. And so, so once we put all that together and it, it was clear that that's what it was going to be, that's what the visual going to be, we, we started to think through, okay, what do we want to communicate visually with this action? We're attacking this symbol of segregation and hatred and slavery and racism, and we want to create a new image of liberation that, that symbolizes the dismantling of it all. And so that's how we came to the decision that James Tyson as a white man should be the one to help me over the fence, to stand guard as I climbed to be arrested with me. Um, and we did that, one, to represent the multiracial nature of the group. Um, we also did it for practical reasons because we recognized that James, as a white accomplice, police were uh, more likely to de-escalate with his presence, as they did, as they did. So as I neared the top of the flag and was getting ready to uh, unhook the flag, the police trained their tasers on me. They had about three of those red dotted uh, lasers from the tasers trained on my behind, ready to shoot me with volts of electricity when I'm attached to a metal pole, which could have electrocuted me. And so if you've seen any of the photos or, or video, you'll see that James is holding onto the pole, and he holds on until I got all the way down, and that's because at that moment he grabbed the pole and he said, if y'all electrocute her, you're gonna have to electrocute me too. Yeah. 
And that's when they back down. One of the interesting questions I get all the time, people say, what, what, what were you thinking about when you were climbing? Or some people who've seen the video, they ask me, what, why were you praying when you were crying? Why were you praying? Why were you praying? I'm, well, do you want me to preach to you? Because I can definitely preach. I can testify. Some people don't want you to testify, but then they keep asking you all these questions about how you have courage and faith, and they don't want you to testify. I don't know how to answer that question for you without testifying to you about Jesus. I can't, I can't tell you how I got the courage to do anything that I did without telling you about my relationship with Jesus. I just I can't. That's my answer. Um, I was praying the whole, the whole time. I had actually planned to do the thing in silence, but, you know, when you get in a situation, <laughs> <laughs> woo, I was reaching for every scripture I knew. I was praying all the way up. I was praying all the way coming back down. And, um, you know, once I got over, they put those handcuffs on me and they were taking me away. That's the other thing people ask me. They're like, well, how did you feel when they put the handcuffs on you and they're taking you into jail? I said, I felt free. I felt free. I felt the type of freedom that the apostles talk about. See, when you have freedom through Christ, see, Jesus has already overcome this world. <laughs> that's, why I can't, that's why I can't answer that question for you without talking about Jesus. That, the, the other question people ask me is, they're like, do you have hope? Why do you have hope? Why do you have hope? <laughs> why do you, again, do you want me to preach? You got time? Because I can preach to you. Because that's the only answer I can give to you. See, I, I serve a savior who's already overcome this world. There's no amount of bars or jail or handcuffs or oppression or slavery or racism or sexism. You cannot put me in bondage. I am already free through Christ. I know what it is to feel like Moses. That's what I'm trying to say. And I don't, and I don't mean I know what it is to feel like Moses because I, I'm, I'm leading everyone through the desert like a leader like Moses. That's not what I mean. I mean, I, I know what it, what it feels like to feel like Moses to, to go through life and have a whole bunch of different experiences. You're not, kinda, you're not all the way sure about how it's all going to add up and, and come together and work out. But I'm telling you, in that moment when I realized that it was a calling for me to climb that pole, everything in my life up to that moment made sense. My experience of oftentimes being in the minority in situations, my experience of, of going through NYU and, and, and studying film, all of those things came together in that moment and it makes sense. And so I just want to say to you that if you ever find yourself feeling like Moses because you recognize that you survived something you weren't supposed to survive, or if you find yourself feeling like Moses because you recognize you're moving in spaces and places that weren't made for you, where people try to make you feel that you don't belong there. If you find yourself feeling like Moses because you find yourself somewhere feeling lost, like it, like it doesn't make sense, like all the pieces of your life aren't connecting. If you find yourself feeling like Moses because you were working toward one set of plans when God had another set of plans for you that you couldn't even dream of. When you find yourself feeling like Moses, that's when you've got to channel the faith of Moses. That's when you've got to trust God like Moses. That's when you've got to obey God like Moses. See, Moses had a speech impediment, like I said. It didn't make sense. None of the stuff that God was saying to him made any kind of sense. That he would be the one to call, be called to go before Pharaoh and speak to Pharaoh, but he trusted God enough to go do it. And didn't it all make sense in the end? And what really doesn't make sense is for us to sit up here believing that God delivered the Hebrews from Egypt but can't or won't deliver us from the racism and spiritual bondage in America. If we would just trust God and let God use us like God, like Moses let God use him. So when we find ourselves feeling like Moses, that's when it's time to draw closer to God, to get still, to say, Lord, you know what I want for my life. But reveal to me what you want for my life. Use me for your greater purpose. Use anything and everything from my life and let me be a vessel for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you.
Someone says, you are my strength, strength like no other, strength like no other, reaches to me, reaches to me. Grab the hand of someone next to you, come on. You are my strength, strength like no other. As you hold the hand of the person next to you, I want you to ask God to let that strength that is like no other, the strength that sustains and the strength that upholds, the strength that saves and redeems, ask God to let that strength well up in your neighbor, in your brother, your sister, your loved one. Ask God to let that strength speak to them in such a way that they can climb every mountain, overcome every obstacle, fight through every spiritual or physical barrier and attack. Squeeze their hand real gently and ask the Spirit of God to give them the strength they need to be faithful, the strength they need to be healed and whole, the strength they need to be hopeful in these perilous times. Now lift your hands right where you stand. Father, in the name of Jesus, it is me, O oh Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, it is not my sister, it is not my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you, God. I need you to give me the strength, the hope, the vision, the courage to do that which the trajectory of my life says may not make sense, but we know you've called us to do. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will give us the faith to step into the unknown and create the opportunity for salvation and healing and wholeness and faithful discipleship. This is our prayer. As you lift your hands, just talk to God for a few moments and invite Jesus in your life if that's what you need to do. Invite the Spirit of God to overwhelm your body and your mind and your will. Invite the strength that is like no other to reach down and grab your lifted hands and pull you to higher ground. Somebody say, take me higher, Lord. Come on, God, take me higher in your will and in your purpose and in your plan. You may be here today and the words of Bree Newsom have moved you so to the place where you are feeling the tug of God to go to another place of faithfulness. You don't know how you're gonna get there. You don't know what you need to do, but you clearly have heard God speak to you today and say, I need to take another step. It may be in my relationship with Jesus. It may be in my relationship with my family or community. It may just even be in your own journey. You are hiding out in not being faithful to what God is calling you to do. And you'd like someone to pray with you, come on out of your seat and meet us right here at the altar. And our prayer counselors will pray with you. We'll touch and agree with you real quick. The Bible says that we should pray and seek the elders and through the laying on of hands. 
we will get strength and encouragement. We'll get support and help for our weary souls. If you need someone to pray with you and walk you through what does it mean to follow the ways of Jesus in such a way that that strength can be yours, that strength that she talked about. Where when someone asks you why, they, they, they got to be ready for a sermon or a testimony because that's the only strength that we know of. And you want someone to pray with you, come on and meet us here at the altar. And I believe that God will meet us. I believe God will meet you. Come on, just come to the altar. We'll, 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 we'll get some prayer happening. You are my strength. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Strength like no other.